next hour on Trial Story. My son is dead! It hurts so much. Police officer Maurice Casada is charged with murder. He killed her and he killed Seth to get out of his responsibilities. But the defense claims there's no evidence. No forensic evidence, no physical evidence. I never hurt anybody. In the next hour on Trial Story, from opening statements to the verdict. Cop on trial, scapegoat or murderer? Valdosta, Georgia is a quiet college town of 42,000 people where old southern mansions, farms, and pecan trees dot the countryside. The soft-spoken residents chose this community to live in because it's a safe place to raise children. But then something tragic happened, which would haunt them forever. Seth was my best friend. I just, I didn't want to be without him. Maurice Casada's son, Seth, never had a chance to see his third birthday. This hysterical 911 telephone call is from 35-year-old Maurice Casada, a 14-year veteran of the Valdosta Police Force. Shortly after getting off work at 3 p.m. on March 30, 1994, he went to pick up his son Seth for a golf outing. But the outing was not to be. It, it just hurts. I can understand now how parents feel when they lose a child. It's the most horrible feeling in the world. Casada claims that when he entered this house, which he purchased for Seth and the child's mother, Donya Jones, the front door was locked, the house was dark, and the curtains were drawn. So I started back towards the bedrooms. I noticed the light on in the bathroom, and I walked over there. And that's what I saw. That was the most horrible thing that I've ever seen in my life. To find my son and his mother that way. It may be some death involved. Please hurry up, please. What's the problem? Just get somebody here, quick. The next thing I remember, I just I ran out of the house just screaming for help. That's all I, that's all that was going through my mind. Oh, was just to get help. Almost immediately after arriving at the crime scene, the Valdosta Police Department called the deaths a murder-suicide committed by Donya Jones. They told us that she had killed Seth and then she had killed herself, which I knew that was impossible because she would never hurt that baby. Two days after finding the bodies, the autopsy results were released. The medical examiner determined that Seth Casada had died from drowning, uh, that Donya Jones had died from strangulation. But in their rush to judgment that the crime was a murder-suicide, the Valdosta police immediately cleaned up the crime scene of potential evidence. Some feel it was done to protect a fellow officer. This is where the bodies were found. This is the tub and actually the area that was cleaned uh, uh, from the testimony at court was the bottom of this bathtub there was a small mark on this wall here that was also wiped off the valdosta police many of them friends of casada did not consider him the killer but jones's mother judy edelman did i feel in my heart that he did it that he killed her and he killed seth to get out of his responsibilities two days after the local police botched the investigation by destroying evidence the district attorney asked the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or GBI as it's known, to take over the case. Casada became the main suspect. On September 1st, 1994, five months after the murders, he was charged with killing Donya and Seth. Prosecutor June Fogel says Jones threatened to take Seth away. She says Casada killed Donya in the master bedroom while his son slept just a few feet away. And he saw... Maurice murdered Anya, and he could say that daddy killed mommy or daddy hurt mommy and then Seth became an impediment. But Casada's attorney Bill Moore says the GBI targeted the defendant. The only suspect in their mind at that time was 
Maurice Casada. Why? Because he's a Valdosta police officer. And the whole thing looked like cover-up to them. Mary and M.L. Casada say Seth was the most important person in their son's life. I have seen Maurice with this child. There is no way that I could ever, ever believe it unless my God tells me so. When he patrolled Valdosta, Maurice Casada was a respected arm of the law, but now inside a Georgia courtroom, he must face the law, accused of killing his small son and the child's mother. What happens when the prime suspect in a crime is a fellow police officer and vital evidence, possibly pointing to the killer, is destroyed? Does this mishandling of evidence somehow imply guilt? Over the course of the next hour, a Georgia jury must decide whether there is enough evidence to convict Maurice Casada. Were the police too inexperienced and inept to handle this case? Or did his fellow police officers intentionally cover up the crimes in order to protect one of their own? We are in the court, everyone, right? Nearly one year after the brutal murders of Donya Jones and her young son, Seth Casada, a jury of 12 and two alternates will be selected. Now I'm going to ask if any of you have any legal excuse to render as to why you should not serve as a juror here this week. Superior Court Judge George Horkin, Jr. has been on the bench for the last 23 years. He's known as a no-nonsense jurist who rules with a very firm hand. In fact, punctuality is imperative. He even fined himself $40 for being just four minutes late. This is a case about a young girl who became involved with a manipulative older man. While Donya Jones's mother listens, prosecutor Ronald Adams explains how Donya became involved with police officer Maurice Casada. After a brief sexual relationship, she gave birth to their son Seth. When Casada told Donya he didn't love her, Adams claims Donya threatened him. Maurice Casada severely beat Donya Jones. And he strangled her. Strangled her to death. He drowned baby Seth Casada. There is not a shred of evidence that can point to the fact that he ever had reason to kill her. <coughs> and to think he could have killed Seth is incomprehensible. Defense attorney Bill Moore says the real killer would have obvious scratches and contusions about his body. Casada didn't have a mark. There had to be a struggle, the evidence will show you. She fought for her life, that there was another DNA source under the fingernail of Donya Jones, and that it was not Maurice Casada's DNA. Call your first witness. Kevin Neese lived across the street from Donya Jones. <coughs> Nice says he spoke to Casada just minutes before he discovered the bodies. Uh, what was the demeanor of the defendant at that point in time? Well, he seemed rather tired and preoccupied. Nice says he heard the police officer screaming for help and called 911. She was lying on her back in the tub, uh, one leg up over the rim of the tub, one arm up. Uh, her face was covered by about an inch or so of water. But Roy Woods, the first officer to arrive on the scene just five minutes after the 911 call, contradicts what the last witness saw. Do you recall there being any water in the tub when you saw that? No, there was not. Moore says the neighbor should be considered a suspect. It was troubling to us for Mr. Neese to get up there and testify that, that he saw water. So you wonder, uh, did he see that? Was that a figment of his imagination? He couldn't have seen it at the time he said he saw it, you know, or uh, had he seen it earlier? We don't know. During cross-examination, Woods says Casada was completely normal at work, but hysterical 40 minutes later at the crime scene. He was uh, completely, um, what I call, emotionally distraught. In fact, the, the crying was, as I think I described, as to point a wailing. It was like I was not even there. Did you notice any scratches, abrasions of any kind on there? No, I didn't. Uh, it didn't appear to be uh, like he'd been in any struggle or fight or anything. Call your next witness, Mr. Adams. The state calls Major Reamer Croft. At the time of the murders, he was a captain in charge of investigations 
for the Valdosta Police Department. Major Croft says a steak knife was found lying across Donya Jones's body, making it look like a murder-suicide. Once we approached it and started moving, getting ready to move the body, there was a slash from the point of the wrist back this way. He is the only one, the only one who would benefit from trying to doctor a crime scene to make it look as though Donya Jones had committed suicide. Major Croft says he ordered his officers to clean the bathtub. In doing so, the Valdosta police destroyed potentially incriminating evidence. Did you attempt to take any prints from the wall of the tub or the tub itself? No, sir. Croft admits that a blood stain found on the wall above the bathtub was also destroyed in the cleanup. Did you instruct your investigators to seize and secure a sample of that blood stain? I did not know, sir. Co-defense attorney Kent Edwards also attacks the witness's handling of the botched crime scene. Fingerprints taken from the walls, tape lifts from the bodies. Any other thing that you could have possibly done it might have also benefited the defendant, might it not? That is correct. So, whatever you did, you didn't do it to help him, did you? No, sir. The state next calls the detective who was assigned the case, Carl Smith. Do you solemnly swear? Smith is also a close friend of the defendant. I can recall trying to record some of the photographs and uh, wiping tears from my eyes while I was photographing the scene. Smith says his friend admitted having a disagreement with Donya Jones just before she died. He cared about Seth and he wanted to continue his relationship with Seth, but he did not want to continue a relationship with Donya. Uh, at that point, uh, Marie said that Donya was, got angry and told him that she could take the, the baby to a Tifton to live with her folks. Seth was too young to me to put in the daycare. He said that he, was, he told her, hell no. He was mad. Detective Smith says that because of the slash on Donya's arm, the police decided it was a murder-suicide and they didn't consider any other possible scenarios for the deaths. Smith says Major Croft ordered him to clean up the tub. We were concerned about the appearance of the bathtub, basically, for the, the uh, feces that were in the tub and we did not want the families to have to come in and find the bathtub looking in that condition. I saw my whole life, you know, flashing before me. You know, I didn't know if I was going to spend the rest of my life in prison for something I didn't do. He was the only person who had motive. He had the opportunity. He had the ability. Donya Jones was a waitress at Quincy's restaurant. Co-worker Kim Lambert says her friend spoke about the defendant just before she died. And she said that she was no longer going to pursue a relationship with Maurice, that she was finished with it. This was my best friend that was killed. I was very upset. I still am. This is hard to recall every single little incident. The state next calls assistant medical examiner Clifford Nelson. We call the cause of death in Donnie Jones uh, strangulation complex complicated by blunt force head trauma. Dr. Nelson believes that Jones was killed around midnight. This, according to the state, was the same time the defendant had an argument with Jones at their home on Perimeter Circle. You cannot establish for this jury a, uh, a time of death. An exact time of death? No. Are the next witness? Belinda Burley is Casada's former girlfriend. She was dating the defendant when he learned that he had a son. On weekends, Casada would travel to Florida to see Seth and Donya. Did it bother you that he was going to a condominium for the weekend in St. Augustine with another woman? No. Why not? Because he wasn't interested in her. And how do you know that? He told me he wasn't. Did he tell you when he no longer had sexual intercourse with Donya Jones? My understanding, it was a one-time thing. Burley says that on Halloween night, 1993, Jones called her and said she was sleeping with Casada. I didn't know who to believe. What had Maurice told you? That he wasn't seeing Donya. 
and based on the conversation you had with her, you believed that he had been seeing her? Yes. That same night, Burley, Jones, and Casada had a three-way telephone conversation. He admitted that he'd slept with her on two occasions, said that she forced him to have sex. And how was it that she was supposed to have forced him to have sex? Because she would take Seth away. She, he told me he loved me and not her. He just cared for her, for Seth. And she was on the phone when he said this? Yes. And what did she say to you about that when she heard that? She just continued to cry. Casada moved out of Jones's home that night and stayed at this motel. A few days later, he moved in with Belinda Burley. I loved Belinda. I cared and I respected Donya, but I was not in love with Donya. Burley says that on March 28th, the night before the murders, Donya called her, begging for one more chance with Casada. She asked me if I'd give her 30 days. 30 days to not to see Maurice. And did you agree to do that? No, I didn't. More notes that Burley's bleached blonde hair is similar to the hair found on one of the victims. I think she is and perhaps should be considered a suspect. I believe Belinda is privy to more information than she's ever shared with me. Call your next witness. Judy Edelman is Danya's mother. She did not approve of her daughter's relationship with Casada. I didn't like it at all. Donya was only 18 and he was 30. Soon after the brief affair, Donya moved with her mother to Jacksonville, Florida. Edelman right. says once she learned her daughter was pregnant, she called Casada. He told me, uh, no, he didn't know she was pregnant, that uh, he had never been with her. I just wasn't going to take her word, especially somebody I didn't know. He called my daughter a whore. And what did you call him? A sorry son of a bitch. Seventeen months after the birth of Seth, Casada learned that DNA tests proved he was the father. Casada immediately went to Florida to see his son. Weeks later, he moved the little boy and his mother to Valdosta. And I told Maurice that if there was ever an occasion that he felt like he had to hit her, to please just pack her up and bring her back home or not take her. And he told me he'd never hit her. More questions, Edelman, about her ex-husband, Terry Roberts. The defense claims that Roberts should also be considered a suspect. Had Terry Roberts ever been abusive to Donya? No, sir. To none of my children. But he was violent with you? Yes, sir, he was. Edelman says she had asked the GBI to investigate Terry Roberts. And I knew he had, how he had been with me. So your reason for asking that was for Agent Hannon to check out Terry Roberts? Yes. The state elicits testimony that in December of 1993, Casada cut off Jones's cable TV and telephone and served her with an eviction notice. Jones then hired divorce attorney Mary Jane York. She had a deadline of around Christmas to get out of the house. That came and went, and we filed the lawsuit. After that, she told me that Maurice had given her a deadline of April 1994 to get out of the house. Tell me how a man can love a child and cut off the telephone to his house. How can this same man send a letter to Donya Jones and say, you will be out of this house by April of 1994 and explain how she was dead on March 30th of 1994. The state claims Casada's new family responsibilities caused him to have serious financial problems. The GBI took over the case after the crime scene had been destroyed. Agent John White says Casada was a playboy. Women have always found Maurice attractive and he's constantly dating different women. The GBI questioned Casada for nearly three hours. The agents never recorded the interview. Afterwards, they wrote an 11-page summary. I chose not to record a three-hour interview simply because we do not have the secretary staff to transcribe a three-hour interview. We were literally 
write books if we did that. Which is more important, the correct administration of justice or your budget? The correct administration of justice and finding of the true facts of any investigation. And you could have found the true facts of what this man said if you recorded it, wouldn't you? I found the true facts because I sat and listened to him and communicated with him for two and a half hours. Okay. I'm an independent observer of facts. I'm a trained law enforcement officer and I know what I look at and I know what I see in the interview. And I'm directing both of you to lower your voices. Can you make mistakes? Yes, sir, I do make mistakes. Co-defense attorney George Saliba then shows that the GBI also failed to gather potentially vital evidence from the crime scene. Did the GBI take the, uh, the drain area from the tub to investigate in any way? I went and visually inspected it myself, but as far as physically removing it, no, sir, it was not removed. There was a wastebasket over here that had uh, diapers in it, uh, which uh, was not taken as evidence. GBI agent John Heinen says Casada wasn't overly emotional during the interview. Uh, when speaking about Donya, uh, agitation, he would be agitated. He would not get angry. During cross-examination, agent Heinen says he questioned seven other suspects. But the defense is trying to show that the GBI never seriously investigated them. Of these various individuals that you have named, how many of them did you obtain blood samples from other than Maurice Casada? I believe there was one. The state rests. And to see your son incarcerated and handcuffed to a chair and knowing all the while, my son is innocent, why is he here? The state has rested its case, you may proceed for the defense. The jury now hears Casada's hysterical 911 call. In a move calculated to catch prosecutors off guard, the defense calls the police officer at the start of its case, even though the defendant has no obligation to testify or even put on a case. I was nervous. I was scared. How long have you been in jail? Five months and 13 days. Donya Jones was just 18 when she met Casada for their one-night affair at a local nightclub. Seven months later, Casada received a telephone call in the middle of the night from Jones's mother, Judy Edelman, about her daughter's pregnancy. Donya never called me. If if Donya had called me, I would have I would have taken it more serious. Casada says as soon as he learned that Seth was his son, he drove to Jacksonville to meet him. I was so happy. It was just I couldn't believe it. I mean, this this little guy. He was so beautiful. How do you love a boy that you deny for his entire existence up until a paternity test comes back? Casada is shown photographs. There's pictures of Seth and me, him in the bicycle seat, and in the morning when he got up. Casada says he moved out of their house in October of 1993 after Jones threatened him with a gun. She informed me that if she couldn't have me, nobody else was going to. She had Seth in one arm, and she had the gun belt in the other hand. And with the same hand that she had Seth, she was trying to pull the gun out of the holster, but she couldn't do it. The officer's attorney sent Jones an eviction notice after she refused to let him see his son, Seth. I wanted to see Seth. I was just trying to get to see my son. That's all I was trying to do. But in January 1994, Casada says Donya Jones agreed to let him see his son as long as Casada lived with his parents, not with his girlfriend. He looked at me like, where have you been, Daddy? And he came running over to me and I picked him up and we just started hugging. Casada says on March 29th, the last night that Jones was alive, she told him she wanted to quit work and go to school. She also wanted Seth to go to daycare and she wanted me to give her an extra hundred dollars a week. Well, I didn't want Seth to go to daycare. He was only two and a half years old. She then informed me that if Seth couldn't go to daycare, that she would take him to Tifton. I said, fine. 
we were in the process of getting something legally on paper to where I would have regular visitations and I could get them. Casada says Donya and Seth were alive when he left at 11.35 p.m. and went straight to his parents' home. The next morning, he went to work as usual. At around 3 that afternoon, he drove to the house to pick up Seth. I started going down the hall. I thought maybe that they were back there taking a nap. When I went back there, I remember the ceiling fan was on. The lights were off. I noticed the bathroom light was on. And I kept calling for him and calling for him. And nobody answered. And when I went in the bathroom, that's where they were. What'd you see, Maurice? I saw Tanya and Seth lying in the bathroom, in the tub. And they were dead. Casada has shown a Christmas club check for Seth. The amount is over $1,200. Has that check been cashed? No, sir. Why have you not cashed it? Because it was Seth. Maurice didn't have anyone else. Maurice finally had something of his own that he could relate to and say, this is mine. Did you maintain a separate account for any purpose, Maria? Separate? Yes, I did. And what was it for? It was for that. And how did you use the separate account? It was his savings account, and it was also an account that I paid his medical insurance. Casada also had a separate checking account and savings bonds for Seth. What are the amount of those bonds, if you add up all the amounts, how, how much is it, Maurice? 100 200 300 400 500 600 700 800 dollars. Casada also took out a $50,000 life insurance policy on Seth. It was a savings plan, so he could go to college on Why'd you buy $50,000? Why'd you buy that amount? Because it's what I could afford. Did you receive any proceeds from that policy? No, sir, I didn't. That was all given to our attorneys. $45,000 of it was. The other 5000 was to pay for Seth's funeral. During cross-examination, Casada admits that while he was living with Jones and Seth, he was also secretly seeing Burley. You were going to her apartment to see her. That is correct. And uh, during that period of time, you and Donya were sleeping in the same bed, weren't you? Sometimes. You knew that Donya Jones wanted you to love her the same way she loved you, didn't you? No, sir, I did not know that. Well, why then are you sneaking around behind her back? Why did you think it was necessary to sneak around behind her back? like I stated before, to keep peace. Now you testified that you did everything you could for Donya, didn't you? Everything possible. Now that everything possible includes deceiving her about the fact that you have an ongoing <coughs> sexual relationship with another woman, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Adams interrogates Casada on finding Seth's body face down in the tub. You just turned and ran out. I went into shock, Mr. Adams. That's the worst thing that I've ever seen in my life. Why didn't you pick that baby up? I already knew, I knew that he was dead. What was it that made you grab her in the throat and crush that highway bone? That's not true, Mr. Adams. You hit her, didn't you, Maurice? No, sir, I did not. You put your hands around her throat and squeezed the life out of her. Did that baby wake up? Mr. Adams, I did not touch Tanya. That baby cry, Daddy's hurting Mama? No, sir. Leave Mama alone? No, sir. 
Danya's stepmother and sister are upset during the aggressive questioning, but the prosecution does not have the last shot. Saliba asks the most important question of all. Did you have anything to do with the deaths of Danya or Seth? No, sir, I did not. After a day and a half on the witness stand, the police officer is excused. The, the way we got through it, the, the only way I think we could handle it was one day, one hour at a time. Valdosta, Georgia is well known for its Air Force base and high school football team. And there you see the Wildcats coming on the field. The Wildcats have been named the best high school football team in the nation three times, something that makes the community proud. Now, instead of packing the stadium, some of the crowd have moved into the courtroom. The murder of Donya and Seth is the biggest story in town. The station that prosecutors love to hate. Kind of split us, basically. Uh, we just never thought anything like this would happen in our town. Mr. Prosecutor, how do you respond to the fact that people are saying you're twisting and deceiving the jury with your lies and deceit? I said, well, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Who do you feel killed Donya and Seth Casada? Answers range from a member of the police department to a co-worker of hers. Well, Mr. Prosecutor, how would you sum up the prosecution's case here in Valdosta? It's hard for me to believe that he could kill his son. Day seven of the trial, and the defense calls the defendant's sister-in-law, Luann Casada. After Casada moved out of the house he shared with Jones, Luann Casada says... Jones would not let her family see Seth. It was awful. Uh, it was just like a missing piece from the puzzle. We missed him terribly. Did you see him uh, at Thanksgiving? No. And what about Christmas? No, we didn't see him at Christmas. On the day Seth and Donya Jones were found murdered, Luann says Casada was crying uncontrollably at his parents' home. Whenever Marie saw me, he grabbed me and held on to me and was crying and I was holding him. Luann Casada says her brother-in-law continued to hold on to his son's watch. I wiped his face, I wiped his neck, and I wiped off both of his arms. He had on a short sleeve shirt and his hands, except for the one that he had the watch in. And I wiped the back of it. There were no marks. Of that, any kind. Not one witness said that they saw a mark of any kind on Maurice's body. Call Grace Casada to the stand. She is the defendant's 87 year old grandmother. Grace Casada is called as an alibi witness. I was watching a TV program and Maurice came home. I could see the, the car lights come in in the driveway. He did. He walked to the back of the house, where the bedrooms are, and he would check on both his mother and I. And then he just went to his bedroom. He did not get out. How do you, how do you know that? Because I'm a light sleeper and I could hear anything. During cross-examination, Adams challenges Casada on whether she really saw her grandson that night. And he used the John. Mm-hmm. Then he testified that he went back to his bedroom and went to sleep. That's right. Okay. So when did you see him, ma'am? I saw him the next morning. The defense calls the state's expert, Dr. George Heron. He conducted two separate you tests on the DNA found under Donya Jones's fingernail. Dr. Heron says he found two sources of DNA and only one matched the victim. The defense is trying to show that the other skin source is from the murderer who's still out there. Does Donya Jones have an AA or AC source? No, she does not. Did you find an AA or AC source in the blood of Maurice Casada? No, I did not. Dr. Heron says he immediately notified the GBI that Casada's DNA failed to match the fingernail sample. The defense claims the GBI continued to target the defendant despite this evidence. So I was telling him that it did not look like the individuals that we had submitted could have donated that second source of DNA. And that included Maris Casada? That's correct. But on cross-examination, the prosecutor tries to show that the fingernail DNA sample may not have been from the murderer. And I don't know what the source of the DNA is, so I can't tell you how it got there. 
Well, I'm asking you, sir, is it possible yes, that... Anything is possible. ...that DNA could have, have been there for any length of time that it took for the nail to grow out. Is that correct? That's correct. Expert witness Dr. Howard Jones, who is no relation to Donya Jones, says she fought hard for her life. Did you raise your right hand? In a strangulation, a person at some point during the strangulation tries to pry the hands off of themselves. And as doing that, they, they tear their own skin. A crime scene photograph, too graphic to broadcast, clearly shows scratches on Donya Jones's face. Donya was in a fight. There's no doubt that she has someone else's DNA tissue under her fingernail. But the state contends that Jones was beaten about the head before she was strangled. Were any of those injuries sufficient to render her unconscious? It's possible, yes. If you have someone who is uh, holding your throat with such force that you are being asphyxiated and your head is being slammed back against the floor or the wall, I don't know that you could really grasp or reach out too much to inflict any injury. If she was in an altercation, I can tell a fight. I can tell definitively that she was awake during a, at least part of the strangulation. The defense suggests there were other suspects. Robert Vick, Jones's manager at Quincy's, was one of the last people to see her alive. Right Who else was present besides you and Miss Jones? Uh, another a male employee, and I'm, if I'm not mistaken, Miss Lambert was there. Did you tell the GBI that someone may have ridden with her that night? Sure. Vic was the only person other than Casada whose blood was tested against the DNA found under Jones's fingernail. However, the DNA did not match. Chris Williams says he saw Donya on March 27th, two days before her death, leaving Quincy's restaurant with her stepfather, Terry Roberts. The defense is trying to show that the GBI should have considered Roberts a suspect because of his alleged history of domestic violence. He was court, escorting her out with his hand up, up underneath her left arm, tightly squeezed. Um, I know Donya because when she looked at me, you know, she gave me the look of, you don't know me, don't say anything. The defense rests. Anything in rebuttal by the state? The state calls Jones's stepfather, Terry Roberts, as a rebuttal witness. On March the 27th of 1994, did you have an occasion to see Donya Jones? No, sir. Defense attorney Edwards tries to tear apart Roberts' alibi. Jones's stepfather lives about an hour's drive from Valdosta and claims he was at home alone on the day of the murder. You stayed at home from 9.30 until shortly after midnight. Right. So you went on your paper route at 12.15 a.m., the early morning hours of March the 30th. Right. And how many hours does it take you to do your paper route? Approximately two and a half to three hours. Stay closed. Stay closed, Your Honor. Defense closed. Defense closes. When people came up and hugged you and said, we're praying for you day and night. We know he's innocent. Meant an awful lot. After two weeks of testimony and nearly 80 witnesses, the attorneys are ready to present their closing remarks. The judge gives them a time limit. One hour per side. There was nobody at that house but Maurice Casada. And nobody, nobody grabbed Donya Jones by the throat and crushed her high old bone. Nobody but that man right there. He will not tolerate her interference in his life anymore. And then he had to deal with the fact that Seth Casada woke up out of his bed and saw daddy hurt mommy. And that two and a half year old boy can talk. And he can say, Daddy hurt mommy. Maurice respected Donya as Seth's mother. He knew Seth loved her. Why would he take that away? Seth was everything to Maurice. He was his identity. Defense attorney Bill Moore says 
The DNA evidence alone should have cleared Casada. No forensic evidence, no technical evidence, no physical evidence, nothing against this defendant. For nearly 30 minutes, no one is allowed in or out of the courtroom as Judge Harkin charges the jury on the law. You are only concerned with the guilt or innocence of this defendant. I just hope and pray that God doesn't let him get away with it. At the end of the second day of deliberations, the jury asks for definitions of reasonable doubt and circumstantial evidence. On Saturday afternoon, 16 hours later, the judge pushes them to reach a verdict. The jurors say the first vote was seven to convict, three to acquit, and two undecided. Because that he was a policeman and because he was a playboy, a lot of people looked at his lifestyle and they didn't like it and that helped make them think he was guilty. On the third day of deliberations, the attorneys first learned that a brother of one of the jurors was recently killed by a Valdosta police officer. The defense is concerned that this juror will convince the others to convict Casada to avenge the death. He was like holding out, I guess you could say, that, uh, that he felt like he had done it. We were out of alternates at that point. Rumors are spreading that the court will declare a mistrial, but in the 25th hour of deliberations, the jury finally has a verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant, Maurice L. Casada Jr., as to count one, not guilty. Count two, not guilty. This I don't think Maurice Casada killed Donya and Seth. I don't think he could have killed him as much as he loved him and then have gone home, got up and went to work, saw people all day and talked to them about Seth. There wasn't enough evidence to really prove that he did do it. It's hard not to, to get emotional. I turned and hugged Maurice and I looked at my law partners and and uh, looked at my wife. Yeah, it was over. Family members, friends, and co-workers surround Casada. There are cheers and tears of happiness for the police officer. He no longer has to go back to his jail cell. Instead, he returns to his home and his job on the police force. Oh, Donnie, oh, God, I would have never made it without you. While the crowds surround Casada. Donya Jones's family leaves the courtroom quietly. I'm glad they're together. She could have never lived without Seth. And if she, if she had died and, and Seth had lived, we would have never gotten to see him again. The street outside the courthouse is packed with Casada supporters. Raise your free man. Like I said, I've got nothing to be ashamed of. Yeah. I'm going home with my family. I don't think I slept uh, a night through that I didn't uh, replay uh, in my mind uh, the sight of uh, little Seth and Donya uh, murdered. That I don't regret and that I don't have to live with the fact that there is a man who murdered a child and a woman walking around free. One month after the verdict, the Georgia Attorney General issued a report condemning the Valdosta Police Department's handling of the case. The phrase that uh, was coined by my chief investigator was it was a, more a conspiracy of ignorance in the handling of the case. Uh, no criminal conduct, but very inept conduct. Since the verdict, there has been widespread fallout. The Valdosta police chief resigned and was subsequently arrested by the GBI on unrelated theft charges. Major Reamer Croft, who ordered the crime scene cleaned, was fired along with an assistant chief. The detective assigned to the case, Carl Smith, was demoted. He left the force and is now a fireman. And as for Maurice Casada, he has resigned from the police department and is now working outside of law enforcement. I want a final answer. And not until I get that will I leave. The case has been turned over to Sheriff Ashley Polk. He says his department is seriously investigating 15 people Polk plans to compare their DNA with a tissue sample found under Jones's fingernail. If they don't cooperate and don't give blood, to me, they don't want to clear themselves, and then that moves them one notch closer to being a prime suspect. 
Subsequent DNA tests from Casada's girlfriend, Belinda Burley, and Jones's stepfather, Terry Roberts, did not match the DNA found under Jones's fingernail. Casada no longer needs to work three jobs to support his family. He now spends his spare time playing golf and remembering his son, Seth. He never leaves me. He's not gone. I go see him out at the cemetery and I sit down and we talk <laughs> he will never be gone not as far as I'm concerned <laughs>